Whether you've been stalked or know somebody who has been stalked, it's all a horrible situation. It's not any fun to deal with at all. And tonight, you'll hear four scary stalking stories. And tonight, we have a guest. The link to her channel will be in the description, so please check it out. Now, enjoy the nightmares. First of all, I'm not sure where to start. My family moved across Pennsylvania after my dad got a new job at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. It definitely was a big step forward, especially coming from a little suburb in Pittsburgh. So, to say the least, the move was nice, but I would have rather had stayed in Pittsburgh, especially after now anyways. We settled nicely in a town about an hour away from Philly. We transferred in the middle of the school year, so I've been finishing my senior year at a small little private school with about 800 kids tucked away in the middle of God knows where. The place was definitely nice, to say the least. The place gave this historic colonial vibe that really intrigued me. Although, there were definitely some lacking factors in this school that I felt needed to be in basic school in the modern age. So to say the least, the school was definitely lacking technological advances, but it was definitely a nice school, so I didn't complain much. I'm a big biology nerd and would rather read a book than play a game of basketball. I'm far from a hermit but I don't play any sports or anything of that sort. So I suppose my interest in science is because it's the nature that started everything. Whether it's the human skin or the earth around you, it can all be explained with logical facts, and I adored that. But my philosophy isn't important, not here at least. Anyways, I was enrolled as a high school honor student, and therefore placed in a bunch of AP classes, one being biology. I was ecstatic to be put in this class, but dreaded the whole introduction phase to the class. I hated the spotlight, and still do. The teacher introduced me, and the whole class said hello. To be quite honest, I was surprised by their hospitality. They actually wanted to get to know me, it was weird to say the least. The first few weeks were great. I've made a whole two friends. This nerdy kid Tyler and this girl Ashley. Small group, but keep the good ones close, I guess. Honestly, I'm in love with the school itself. The people, the staff, the architecture itself is incredible. For those three weeks, I walked with my head held high, and I loved every second of it. But I found something in my locker this morning, and I'm not entirely sure how to go about this, but I received an envelope in my locker, and the following is a series of notes I received. I watched as you walked into class. You're quite perfect. The way you talked made me melt. Your voice is so soothing, I could listen all day. I was thrown off by your intellect. Such a cute boy couldn't have been that smart. I apologize for assuming, but clearly I was wrong. I suppose it's best if I remain anonymous, but I can't let this go without you knowing. Call it an obsession if you wish. But I promise, at first, it was a harmless little crush. But as the days moved forward, and I'm exposed to you more and more, I think I'm beginning to fall in love with you. Although, we've never spoken, it's like some force is here to pull us together. 
Do you feel it, James? Do you? I'll tell my name when the time is right. When I'm ready. When I feel you're ready as well. I've been noticing, though, you talking to that little skank, Alyssa. You don't want her, James. I know you want me. I know it. I'm what's best for you, not her. The things we could do together would blow your mind. I've always been a bad girl. If only you knew. Maybe I don't dress like the skanks. But I'm definitely a skank in the bedroom. Just ask your friend Tyler. He'll know. I've watched you from afar. That cute smile makes me melt. But I suppose I'm repeating myself, huh? Last Tuesday, you looked at me and gave me that adorable smile. And I just looked at you. Shocked by how such an amazing person could be acknowledging me. I often daydream about what it would be like for us to be together. Can you imagine what our wedding will be like? Can you imagine our kids? Love, Bio Girl. Note 2 Truly, I think you're an amazing boy. I love you, James. I really do. Call me creepy or obsessive, but I don't care. I need you in my life. I don't care if we've never talked. It feels like we've known each other our entire lives. I found your social media accounts the other night. My friend helped me search. So, you're from Pittsburgh, huh? Never been there. Maybe you can show me sometime. I'd love to watch your eyes light up underneath the star-filled skies as we seal a kiss. Maybe we can start our family there. I've began my artwork of you, James. And God, you're gorgeous. And I'm so glad I can capture your essence of beauty from afar. Your photos are absolutely to die for. You're stunning, and that's what makes you so perfect. That's why you must be mine. Why do you still talk to those whores, James? Am I not good enough for you? Do I have to wear barely any clothing to get your attention like they do? I suppose anything for you. I love you. Yesterday, you looked at me in biology. The teacher was talking about replications of DNA. But it was like everything paused when you gazed into my eyes. I know it was only for a second... But I've always wondered what was going on in that head of yours. Your eyes are quite lovely. Did you notice me? Did you like me? Do you? It was safe to say that the rest of that day, I daydreamed about getting out of my seat and confessing my love to you. I just want you to hold me, James. I want to feel your embrace. James... I love you. I'll always love you. We'll be together. Forever. I love you. And I'll keep saying it until you love me back. Love your princess. Note 3 Call me creepy if you wish. I suppose I'd understand. This is true love though. I've went to lengths those sluts that you talked will never bother to go. James, I'm not one of the quiet girls. I just can't talk when I'm around you. To be quite honest, I don't think you've ever heard my voice. I promise you, I plan to reveal myself. We'll be together soon. I just know it. I can't wait to feel your arms around me and kiss your precious lips. 
The thought of it makes me quiver. We only have one class together, but I know so much about you from so little time we've spent together. That cologne you wear is incredible. Really makes you even more irresistible, to be honest. The other night, I followed you home, James. I promise I have no intention of harm, just observation. That's a nice car, by the way. Quite the drive out of town. But honestly, I don't regret it. I needed to see your family. Your house is quite lovely. Is that your retriever outside? I'm sure you're an incredible dog owner. I'm sure that dog loves you just as much as I do. The dog and I aren't much different, you know. Both of our worlds revolve around you. We just didn't know it until you were there. I snuck around your shrubs out front in the dark and peered through the window of the dining room and watched while you ate dinner. You still had that adorable smile on your face, but it seemed your face was buried in that phone of yours. You weren't texting that slut Ashley, were you? Your mind, James, not hers. But your family looks perfect. They really do. I absolutely can't wait to be a part of it all. I can't wait to be your girlfriend, your wife, your forever. Love, your forever. Note 4 Today, I watched you come in late to class. What's wrong? You seemed a little out of it, sort of like you were sick. I wanted to hug and make everything better. I really did, but I suppose it's a little early for that. James, you know I love you. I know you love me too. You just don't want to admit it yet. I just wish you would stop talking to those pieces of shit you call friends. If only you knew the things they did to me. If only you knew how Tyler hurt me. But I know you wouldn't hurt me like that, right? It's been three weeks, James, and I'm more in love with you than I've ever been my whole life. I want you. I need you and I'll go to whatever length to get you. Can you feel it? Because this is true love. I just know it. I know you're curious of why I wrote all that and gave them to you at once. And honestly, I just need you to see how in love I am. Do you love me back? To these letters I've attached some of my hair and a drawing I made of you, so a part of me can always be with you. Love, the girl in biology. This made me so sick to my stomach. I immediately ran down the hall into the bathroom and puked at the closest toilet possible, note still in hand. What the hell was this? I haven't talked to anyone other than the few close friends I've made. Clearly, Someone was watching me, though, and the thought of that gave me chills. It's been weird ever since. It's like I've been extra cautious and somewhat paranoid. The fact is, I don't know who it is, so I can't avoid them, and I've been looking for Tyler, but I can't seem to find him. I'm hoping he knows about this. I'm hoping... He's had a similar situation that he can help me. After all, the note said something about him. I'm not sure if I should be scared, or anxious, or possibly even flattered. This girl literally wrote me a love letter confessing how she was obsessed. She's been to my house, and I've had no idea. I'm not sure if it is worth talking to the principal, though. After all, 
this could just be one big prank on the new kid. But who would go to such lengths to mess with someone? Maybe this was some sort of hazing process. Whatever the hell it was, it was really absurd. The person went to the lengths of visiting my home without my permission, and has been stalking me for god knows how long. Was it really possible someone's been watching me and I didn't realize it? Was this whole thing even real? I informed Ashley about everything today as well, and she's just as shocked. But as far as she's known, Tyler never even dated anyone crazy like that. Tyler hasn't had a girlfriend since he's been in the 8th grade. And even then, it wasn't anything major. The note said that he hurt her. I've sent a DM to Tyler and asked him about the anonymous girl. And so far, he's been clueless. This whole thing has been terrifying. Ashley's offered to help track down my little secret admirer, but I'm not sure if that'll get any more. Since then, it's been one big game of guess who, where everyone's suspected, and no one shall be left unnoticed until the writer is revealed. I'll let you guys know what I'll do next as soon as I figure out this whole thing and try to piece some things together. Just please let me know if you guys have any ideas on what could be happening. My dearest Angela, your beautiful lush hair flowing in the wind as you carried your groceries out to your car was the most elegant event I have ever seen in my life. When you got out of work and accidentally spilled your coffee and your co-worker and you decided to help clean it off her, it proved to me that you are a wonderful soul. When you were clipping your toenails and you saved them in a pile so they wouldn't go everywhere, these are just small events that make me fall for you. I'm proud to say that I truly love you. That note was taped to my window about three days ago, sealed in an envelope. Someone has been leaving notes for me for the last month or so. I've tried going to the police with the first note, but they thought I was crazy and conceited and that I just wanted attention. I haven't tried going back. To be honest with you, I kind of enjoy the notes. I enjoy being the center of somebody's world. I know that if I tell my parents about these, they'd freak out, so I haven't yet. As long as he doesn't do anything to me, I guess I'm fine with it. The weird thing is, this morning the delivery man dropped off a sealed box on my front porch. I opened it, and it was a DVD. I guess he made a video for me? I open it, and put it into the DVD player. It was a man, sitting at a bench by the lake, back turned to the camera. My dearest Angela, I'm so glad that you decided to watch this video. I guess I'm getting closer to finally introducing myself. Just the thought of that makes me fill with excitement, but also anxiety. I have a tendency to fall for people too easily, but I really hope you are the one. I hope that you are the person that completes my world. He stood up and turned to the camera. He was wearing a large black hat with a rim, a brown trench coat, dress pants, a black button-up, and dress shoes. He dresses really well. I kind of fell for him at this point. I wanted to know who it was. Angela, I have been watching you for over a month now, and I can say that you are the most perfect human I have ever observed. Ever! 
I've fallen so deeply in love with you that it makes me sick sometimes. Love sick. <laughs> well, that's all for now. I'll introduce myself to you soon enough. I love you. Oh my goodness. My stalker is actually hot. Like, insanely hot and rich, potentially. I really wanted him to introduce himself to me. I wouldn't mind meeting him. I know in these circumstances I probably shouldn't want to meet him, but I've been lonely lately and been wanting some companionship, you know? It isn't too much to ask for. That night, after work, I wore my silk pajamas. They were a little big on me, but extremely comfortable. I got ready for bed, as usual, but I couldn't sleep. All I could think about was the man in the DVD, how he dressed so well. His voice was like music to my ears. I kind of wanted to stay awake to see if he would come once again, but I fell asleep after laying down for a short time. When I woke up in the morning, I wasn't wearing the silk pajamas anymore. I was wearing my usual shorts and a t-shirt to sleep. I swear that I remember wearing my silk pajamas. I went to the washroom to check my laundry basket, and surely my work clothes from last night that I changed out of were there. Someone changed me out of my clothes and put on new ones for me. Someone was in the house last night. I ran outside my room, and sure enough, everything was in order. I looked on the living room table, and there was a DVD there. My Dearest Angela, it was titled. I opened it with anxiety and put it into the DVD player. Oh my god. It's me sleeping. My Dearest Angela. How I am so glad that we finally meet. I've seen you on the street. I've walked past you many times. I can smell the shampoo you use. I've touched your skin before, but not this delicately. I hope that I won't wake you, but if you do wake, please know that I will restrain you and We'll have some fun. If you don't wake, I'll just take a little memoir of you until the next time. I was watching myself be undressed by this man. He was wearing blue jeans, a black sweater with his hood on, and a baseball cap to cover his face. Angela, you are so beautiful. You are as divine as an angel. I hope that you see this video that I've seen the most intimate parts of you, the most intimate moments of you when you were sleeping. Please know that I mean no harm to you unless you fight me. I love you. He took my favorite pair of shorts and t-shirt from the drawer. It was like he knew everything about me, what I enjoyed wearing where everything in my room was. He dressed me. And left. The next morning, I called in sick to work. I was too afraid to do anything. This man could come into my house and do anything to me. He could have killed me. But he didn't. Thank God. I peered out my window to see if there was anyone on the street and suspicious individuals, but I couldn't see any. I got in my car and drove towards my workplace to see if anyone was following me. Sure enough, 
I saw a silver Toyota Camry. Not too many cars down, following me since I took a left off my street. He knew exactly when I would go to work and the route I would take. I knew it was him. I continued to go towards my work to make sure that I had the right person. And when I parked my car and walked up the steps of my workplace, I turned around. I spotted that silver Toyota Camry as he drove off. As soon as he drove off, I got back in my car and drove towards my parents' house. I rang the doorbell as soon as I could, as soon as I parked my car outside. Mom, open the door, please! I know you were home, please! I was sobbing at this point, worried that if I was outside for too long, he'd notice me, and he'd know where my parents lived. The door opened. Angie! What's wrong? Come inside! Immediately, I ran for the blinds. I closed them all and turned on a little lamp in the living room. Mom, sit down. Please, I need to tell you something. Honey, what's wrong? Mom, I have a stalker. He was in my room last night and he undressed me and took my pajamas then put new clothes on me. What? Have you called the police? No, I thought it was fun and games at first, but then he decided to come into my house. If he knew how to do that, he could do anything. Mom. Joe, come here. My father ran down the stairs. Sure. Angie! Oh my god, what's wrong, baby? Daddy, I have a stalker. And last night he came into my house. Baby, I'll contact my friend who's part of the police. I'll take care of it, okay? Okay. My mother held me in her arms as I was sobbing, afraid at what happened last night. I thought everything would be fine. I thought my parents would take care of me. That night, I went into the guest room and lay down in the bed. The room was on the second floor of the house, with the window turned toward the back, so I felt a little safer that he wouldn't find me here. And if he did, he wouldn't be able to climb to the second floor of the house. I changed into the pajamas I borrowed from my mom and I went to bed. I heard something. Like a dull noise. Mom? No response. Dad? No response. I stepped out of my room and heard a door close downstairs. It was the back door. I looked towards my parents' room and the door was slightly open. I opened the door. Mom? Dad? <gasps> Honey. My mom was gasping for air. <laughs> Get out of here. I turned on the light. My eyes opened wide. Mouth dropped, tears beginning to flow down my face. My father's head had dropped onto the floor, severed from his body which was stabbed many times. My mother had her throat cut and was laying in blood pooling underneath her. I screamed in horror, crying anxious. There was a DVD. I walked towards the DVD and it was labeled. You shouldn't have run away. I missed you. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. He'll always find me. He killed my parents. I didn't watch the DVD that night. I couldn't sleep. 
but I got a text in the morning from an unknown number. Angela, watch the DVD. Help. Please. I've decided to write this out in the case that something bad happens to me. I've begun to play a dangerous game, and I can't guarantee that I will come out on top. It all started about a month ago. I work at a small grocery store stocking shelves. I work through the day and partly into the night, usually getting off work around 10 or 11 p.m. I live in a bigger city, so even though I do have a car, I walk to work. My workplace is only a little over a mile from my apartment. So, it's probably quicker to walk anyways and get out of the way of traffic. Plus, it gives me a little bit of exercise. For context, I am a smaller guy. I stand about 5 foot 6 and weigh around 140 pounds. I wouldn't consider myself particularly attractive either. I wouldn't consider myself particularly attractive either, but I suppose that's not all that a stalker looks for when picking a victim. I first noticed him when I was about to finish up my work for the night. He was taller, at least six foot two. He wore baggy clothing, so I couldn't really put a good estimate on his weight. But he had to be at minimum 220 pounds. White. Probably mid-40s. He also donned a baseball cap. He was a couple aisles over, so I couldn't really make out facial features. Of course, there was nothing to be alarmed of at this point. But I'm a very paranoid person. And, for whatever reason, this person set off alarm bells for me. I made a mental note to be more aware of my walk home that night. Once my shift ended, I left the store. I didn't spot the man on my way out. After I had traveled a couple blocks, I pulled out my phone and took a selfie. I didn't do this to post to social media, or to send to a friend. No, I used this selfie as a way to get a view of what was behind me without looking suspicious. After looking around in the photo and zooming in, my heart began to beat faster. The man from the store was there. He was quite a distance behind me, but he was there. I couldn't be 100% certain it was him because I had to zoom in so much that the photo became pixelated. But if I had to put money on it, I wouldn't think it could be anyone else. I began to pick up my pace. The roads were still busy, so I wasn't afraid I would be assaulted here in the streets. But if someone was following me, I didn't want to lead them back to where I lived. A few blocks away from my apartment, was a crosswalk, the only one I needed to cross to get home, so I knew if I could beat him across there, then I would easily be able to lose him. After I made it past the crosswalk, I pulled out my phone and took another selfie. In the background down the previous street, he was still there. Unless he risked getting run over though, he wouldn't be able to catch me tonight. When I made it home, my heart was still beating out of my chest, even though I knew I was safe. I should have called the police right then, told them about what had happened. They could have taken a look at the store cameras and possibly identified the man. I could ask my boss to switch me to day shifts to avoid a situation like this again. Those are things I should have done, but I didn't. I had never thought of myself as an adrenaline junkie, but this experience had awoken something in me I didn't know existed. I don't know what this man wants from me, 
At this point, it was still quite possible that I was simply overly paranoid, and the man was simply making his way home as I was. Oddly, part of me hoped that wasn't the case. Whatever this was, I didn't want it to end yet, but I also have no intentions of being a victim. I didn't spot the man while I worked the next day, but once I was off, I decided to once again use my selfie trick. It turns out my new friend would once again be joining me on my walk home. Much like the previous night, I quickened my pace. I still didn't want him to know where I lived, at least not yet. Once again, I managed to lose him at the crosswalk, but he had certainly gotten closer this time. Over the next two weeks, this game played out much the same, with him inching closer each time, until finally he made it past the crosswalk. I'm sure he saw where I lived that night. The first time he made it past the crosswalk, but he still did not make his move yet. He wasn't the only one making progress though. I had began prepping myself as well. It's incredible the things you can buy online nowadays. My first investment was a taser. I carried this on my walks home just in case he tried to pull anything outside my apartment. But since he follows me on foot, it's my belief that he won't try anything until he's inside my home. So naturally, my next move would be to booby trap my apartment. I live alone and don't get any normal visitors. Even the landlord never bothers me as long as I pay my rent. So setting up traps in my apartment wouldn't be a danger to anyone except my stalker, and potentially myself. The first trap I set is by far the most simple. A makeshift tripwire just inside my front door. It's not connected to anything complex, as its name suggests. It is just there to trip my friend over, or at least make him stumble. It won't do any extensive damage, but should it work, it would at least alert me to my stalker's presence. The next trap is also simple, but perhaps a bit more cruel. You see, the main floor of my apartment is wooden, so I took the liberty of removing a couple of boards leading to my room and placing a fine row of nails in the space underneath. I then placed the boards back and made sure it was very loose, so if anyone were to step on those boards, they may have an unpleasant experience. My third trap is probably the trickiest. This relies on a string attached to my door. I set this trap each night before I go to bed and disarm it each morning I wake up. The string is connected to a hammer set at the top of my door. Once the door is more than halfway open, the hammer should be triggered to swing downwards. Based on my estimations of the man's height, the hammer should land somewhere on his forehead. I only hope there should be enough tension in the trap to create a force strong enough to knock him out. My final trap isn't so much a trap as it is a decoy. Should the intruder make it past all my traps and approaches the figure in my bed, they won't find me. Instead, when they remove the covers, they will find a mannequin. I haven't slept in my bed since the first time I saw him. Instead, I sleep under it. There, I will be waiting, with my trusty taser in the hand, of course. It didn't bother me. I didn't bother trapping any of the windows, because they are far too small for this man to fit through. If he wants in, it will have to be through the front door. I'm still not entirely sure what I will do with the man should I succeed. I have rope on hand to tie him up. Shout out to YouTube for teaching me how to properly tie knots. And duct tape of course to cover his mouth. 
Whatever I do, I don't think I can tell the police about this. It's too late for that. There's also a chance that I don't succeed. If he makes it past all my traps and somehow manages to disarm me, then I know there is no way I can outfight him. I don't know what his full intentions are, but that's part of the game. Now, all that's left to do is wait for him to make his move. I'm writing this after I got off work tonight, and he has gotten closer than ever. He even walked past my front door a few minutes after I made it home tonight. Actually, I think I can hear noises coming from my front door now. Wish me luck. I found this note, nailed onto a tree on my front lawn. I really don't know how to describe it. I'll just let you read it for yourself. I saw you today. It was your birthday. You didn't see me. You hardly ever do these days. Your skin looked so nice and healthy, and your eyes? They were the most beautiful I'd ever seen them. You've grown so much. I remember how different you used to look when you were younger. I remember the day I first met you. It was four years ago. I was sitting on my desk, head down, listening to the teacher rattling off names for attendance. The teacher called out a name I didn't recognize, and a stranger's voice answered behind me. Was there a new student? The teacher didn't pause for a second, just continued calling out name after name. I turned my head to where the voice had come from. I saw you. A pale thing, so thin, your eyes so red, at a seat that should have been empty. I saw fireflies flying around you. Flickering. Dozens of them never straying far from you. I saw them going through you and coming out through your skin like you were a mist to them. Can you believe... I thought you were a ghost. No one else seemed to acknowledge the new stranger sitting at the back of the class. Class after class, hour after hour passed as I waited for something to happen. For someone to notice you, for you to leave, for you to let out a ghoulish scream and claw at me like in the horror story I was certain I was in, but... Nothing... Happened. Teachers came and went. My classmates laughed and slept, and you just sat there. The bell rung for recess. The other kids ran to do their mundanities for the day, leaving me and you together in the empty classroom. You stood up and pulled a chair from the desk next to you, making it face yours. You turned your head to me, and spoke. Well, you're slow today. Come on, ask me your questions. I don't know why I didn't run away screaming at that moment. Probably would have turned out better for me in the long run, but let's not speculate. I guess at that point in my life, I was pretty bloody lonely. I figured there was only a 50-50 chance you'd eat me, and the other 50 was that someone wanted to talk with me. Kid priorities don't make sense to me either these days. So, I went along with the flow. I walked over to your desk, sat down on the chair you pulled for me, and asked my question. 
What were you? You told me that you didn't know. You said that once you were a child, just like me with parents and friends. You used to go to the same schools as me. Then, one day, one ordinary day when you were ten, you just woke up. And you were like this, covered in fireflies, and no one could remember you the moment they concentrated on anything else. No one, not even your parents. You told me of how I'd noticed you every day. How I'd think of you until recess every day. How I'd come to you every day. How we would talk every day. How we would meet for the first time every day for the last three years. About how I'd forget the instant I walked out of the room. How everyone would forget you. How the fireflies would make them. How for the last three years, you'd been alone. Your story was very hard to believe, so I didn't. I asked what reality prank show I was on. You looked, well, unimpressed, and asked me to continue telling my story. I was caught off guard by the non sequitur. You said, last time I was here, I was telling you a story, a horror story about a haunted house. As you detailed the story, goosebumps prickled my skin. It was a story I'd been making up in my head. A story I hadn't told anyone yet. At that moment, a million reactions were open to me, all simultaneously adequate and inadequate. But the only thing that seemed proper was to finish the story for you. So, I did. Halfway through, you interrupted me to ask if my mother had recovered from her sickness yet. I had to shake my head, a bit ashamed at the fact that I shared this private matter to a stranger. The story ended a few minutes before recess. My next class was in another room. You told me to go. Your steadiness took me back. You seemed so accepting of your fate, like you'd already gotten used to the idea of being forgotten forever. <laughs> I was a kid back then. I wasn't a particularly smart kid, and I was probably on the onset of a crush, so... You can excuse what I did next as an example of my childhood stupidity. I grabbed my scissors, pressed it against my arm's skin, and dug in. As it drew blood, I pushed it forwards till the cut formed the shape I wanted. Letter by letter, I carved your name onto my arm. Just so you know, I don't regret that. Don't get me wrong, kid power might have made me do it, but... It sure as hell didn't make the pain go away. It was one of the most painful experiences of my life. But even then, as a kid, I thought what was happening to you was unfair. I remember how your eyes looked when you saw that. The confusion. How strange it was for you that anyone would want to remember. I remember that look so clearly. When I woke up the next day and saw your name on my arm, I remembered you. I didn't forget. That day, for the first time, we had a conversation that wasn't so one-sided. You said no one had 
ever done anything like that before and suggested I might have a mental illness. I won't deny it, that drew a little blood. As we talked, a creeping thought came into my head. Did you prefer it when I didn't remember? That night, I was sitting up on my bed, staring at your name on my arm, wondering if I should cover it up so I couldn't see it and give you back your privacy. When I heard a crash. I looked up to see my bedroom window shattered and a dirty rock on the floor. I looked out of the cracked window to see a dark figure on my lawn. You were outside yelling about how we should hang out. It took me a while to get used to how bad you were at talking to people. Years without practice made you quite a bit rusty. That was alright. We had a lot of time. For the next two years, we spent the most of our free time together. Most of the time, we talked. You'd tell me an aspect of your life and how you lived. You still stayed in your old house. Your parents never noticed the food gone missing, never noticed the extra room, and you'd stolen the extra keys. One night, I confided in you that I was beginning to think you were a part of my imagination, fight club style. After all, what could you do to me that I couldn't do to myself? You spent the next month or so trying to leave bite marks on my ear or neck to prove a point. I still have some on my ears, so I guess you did. Looking back, I could see the warning signs, even then. Your skin seemed to get worse and worse, paler and paler, and you'd rub your eyes raw. It was in the winter we had our wake-up call. The morning began like any other. I woke up, brushed my teeth, and started searching for clothes to wear. It was a winter morning and my room was dark, so I didn't see your name on my arm. The cold sent shivers through my body, and I pulled out a long sleeve jacket. A small bell rang in my head. Don't you usually roll your sleeves up? Yeah. And why did I? I finished tidying up and headed to school. On the school bus, I felt oddly content. Like something I'd been worrying about had just disappeared. I walked up the school stairs, down the hall, through my class door, and sat down on my desk. The same feeling of a burden forgotten hounded my mind. What was I forgetting? When recess came, I just sat at my desk while my classmates ran out. It felt like a ritual, but... I didn't know what for. I was contemplating just walking out to join them when I heard it. It was something small in the wind, but it came over and over, incessant. It sounded like my name. I knew this was strange, that this was worth my attention, but I felt oddly calm. Everything would be all right. Everything would be fine, just ignore it. I sat there on my desk, my mind a war zone between two conflicting, contradictory voices, when I felt a force tugging at my sleeve. The moment I noticed this, my jacket sleeve tore open. I saw your name on my arm and then your hand that had ripped my jacket open. You'd been yelling at me for over 20 minutes. I think that was the moment we realized how on edge our friendship really was. One accident away from complete erasure. 
We spent the most of the next year in the town library together, trying to figure out what the fireflies were. It wasn't really a problem for me. Because of my mother's treatment, my family couldn't afford to go on any trips, and our house didn't have heating anymore, so I was happy to spend time with you. Trying to find information was a puzzle in and of itself. After all, how would I read about people I couldn't remember? And how would you find out who was special when no one could even remember enough about them to record them? We found old family trees and records. Individually, we would write down the name of everyone in the book on two lists and then we would compare. The names I hadn't remembered to write down, but you had, would become the focus. They were the names who were under the curse of the fireflies. We compiled a list of suspicious books. Books we thought could help us because they were written by or were about the people we were searching for. I'd read the books with a list of names side by side, reading it again for every page of the book. You'd search the internet on the library computers for articles about the people. Our search would lead us to the first glimpse we got of what was really happening to you. It was late at night when you found the picture. I was a bit drowsy at that time and almost about to nod off when I heard a sharp intake of breath. I turned to see you standing up, pointing at the screen. I didn't see anything. Well, anything noteworthy. On the screen was a picture of a clearing somewhere in the woods. You held up your piece of paper where you'd marked out two names. Susie Appleby Reagan, 13. Terry Appleby Reagan, 12. Siblings. For a moment, I saw the paper and the screen side by side. Side by side. And then, I saw them. Two figures emerging from the woods towards the camera. They were almost humanoid, but all five limbs stretched to nightmarish proportions. Blank white skin, pure albino that looked more like tree bark than anything on a mammal. A cloud of fireflies surrounded the duo. The shorter one looked emaciated. I could see the rib cages around which their. their. eyes, God, their eyes. So small, so red. The longer one with their white hair didn't look alive anymore. They were just skin wrapped around skeletons. Their empty eye sockets had fireflies swarming out of them, both reaching for the cameraman. I looked at the article surrounding the picture. It was a blog post by a hiker 20 years after the two kids had been written about last. The picture was a mystery to the cameraman as well. He'd been wanting to go to the woods pictured for a while now, but he never actually remembered going there. The picture had just appeared in his camera one day out of the blue. For a moment, I looked at your face. Your thin, pale face with those red veined eyes. Would that be you when my scar faded? Just a walking horror I'd glimpse, then forget? We worked through our reading list at a much faster pace, starting from that moment. Maybe we should have gone slower. At least every book, every website we'd left untouched promised hope. The books we finished and tossed aside promised nothing but the clearing in the woods as your future. And we tossed aside 
a lot of books. I believe I tore through three-fourths of my reading list before I stumbled across the journal. Oh god, that horrible, horrible journal. The journal used to belong to a mental patient named Joey who claimed to be a serial killer. He was locked up in an asylum when the police discovered his supposed victims never existed. He was diagnosed with a need for attention and shoved away. They should have electrocuted him. They should have fried him until his flesh melted and his hair burned. In the journal, he talked about how he carried out his killings. He knew things, bizarre and disturbing things no one else knew. He knew of strange creatures that lived in the woods. Of them, his favorite were the fireflies. I'm not going to tell you how he summoned these things. I trust you. I, I trust you more than anyone, but a thing like this belongs to the ground more than it ever will to the human mind. It's sufficient enough to know that these things were not fireflies. Joey would start his ritual by taking a kid, any kid, anyone he liked, he could take them at any time, the dead of night, in their own homes, or just in broad daylight on their front yards. It didn't matter if he was seen. He'd take them to his house and drag them to a room. Usually an amber alert came up around now. He didn't care. Like I said, it wouldn't matter soon. He dragged them to a special room in his house. Here, the fireflies would come and latch onto them. Now, nobody was searching for the kids. Not the police, not the parents, nobody. From then on, he could do whatever he wanted to the kid. He'd get bored of them after a day or two after the child had broken. And then the kid would go too. Hacksaw, kitchen knife, anything would work. He detailed a large pit of bodies he kept in the woods, swarming with the bugs. I guess he got bored of that too one day, so one day he went right to the police station and turned himself in. Not of guilt. No, no, no. He just wanted someone to know about the stuff he was doing. Sick fuck. Oh, don't get the wrong idea, he never stopped killing kids. The asylum doors didn't stop him from doing what he liked. It just made him improvise. He made a new way. He modified the flies so they could survive without a host, just in a dormant state. When a child, he specified the age, would approach the swarm, it would latch on and begin its effect. Over the years, the child would warp horribly into the things we saw in the woods. I wish I could hate him in peace. I wish I could say the world owed him nothing. But that wouldn't be true. He detailed a way out. On the final page was an exact explanation on how to get rid of the fireflies. You must have seen something in my face because at that moment you asked if I had found anything. I said no and closed the book. A few minutes later, you shut down the computer. You picked up the last book and went through it yourself. When you reached the end cover, you tossed it aside. I asked what we should do now. 
You said it was all right. I could go home. We'd talk about it in the morning. I stood up and walked past the shelves of books. I headed for the library entrance but stopped right outside the door and waited. I waited until I heard the sniffling sounds. I sneaked back to our table where you were quietly sobbing. You had your head in your hands. I sat back down as you raised your eyes to me. You said you'd wished you never met me. How happy you were when you had nothing to lose. How I ruined your life. <laughs> you'd never really gotten better at talking to people. That was the worst love confession I'd ever heard. I remember how we kissed that night. I remember your hands gripping my hair. I remember that kiss. I wish it could have just been a kiss. I'm sorry. I ruined that moment. When my arms were around you, I was close enough to steal a firefly without you noticing. I remember holding the fireflies in my hand. I remember how it struggled until it didn't. Until it was a part of me. The fireflies shifted that came over to me and left you. I remember the familiar look in your eyes, the confusion. I never wanted to see that confusion in your eyes again. You deserved to be loved and you deserved to know that. I wasn't really living anyway. You reached for me. I pulled away as the last lights of recognition faded from your eyes. And then, you were just staring at a stranger, walking away into a crowd of strangers. That was a year ago. You've gotten so much better since then. You have so many friends now, so many people at your birthday party. You also look so much healthier. I haven't been as fortunate. My skin's gotten a lot paler and my eyes hurt all the time now. I couldn't go to school like you did all those years. I haven't wasted my time though. I found Joey's pit. The bodies. <laughs> there were so many bodies. There's a grave for those children now. Without me, my mom could afford her surgery. She looked so happy. Just yesterday, I saw her playing with my baby brother. I saw you crying yesterday. You were with your friends, laughing. For a brief moment, your eyes met mine and then they were so... wet. I think I'm going away. For good, I think. You're not going to be happy if I stick around. I'm so happy. I met you. Even if you don't remember me. Sometimes I go through depressive episodes. I feel so lonely, even with my friends. I don't know what's going through my head during these times. And sometimes I'd end up in a bathtub, a knife in my hands and my wrists bleeding. Until now, 
I thought I was cutting my wrists. I wasn't. The cuts. They're letters. I've been carving a name onto my arm. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I appreciate it a lot. And also, big thanks to my patrons, and if you want to support me, the link to my Patreon is in the description below. And if you want to hear more scary stories in the future, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment on this video. Thank you.